ran across something last night that I think you'll find interesting. I was trolling around on Amazon and found a book and just barely got started reading it, but it's, uh, it's written by these uh, two archaeologists that are actually biblical scholars as well. One of them's Israeli, and the other one is Tabor, who's at Princeton, I think. And he's the one that did a lot of the work on the Jesus family tomb that was discovered, as well as some of the ossuaries that were there. Apparently, there's been this book that's been languishing in, the, uh, in a library in London for hundreds of years that no one could figure out. Uh, it was found in a monastery, so they were fairly certain that it was a religious book, but it made no sense. The title of it was Joseph and Azareth. No one could figure out what this book had to do with anything, so it's kind of just languished for hundreds of years until these two people apparently found a letter from a monk 500 years ago that had been kind of responsible for translating it. Supposedly, it is a gospel that was written by a church group that had split off from the James group in Jerusalem and the Paul group, and they kind of had different beliefs than either one of those two groups, but they were, this group was in Italy, right in the center of the Roman Empire, so the gospel was written in code. Now, you always got to be, you know, whenever someone says, hey, we found this gospel and it was written in code and we figured out the code and everything, you have to be a bit wary of stuff like that. But apparently this, and I just read the prologue to the beginning of the book, so I don't have any of the details, but it's apparently a book about Jesus. It, it's a gospel about Jesus, and it portrays him as being married to Mary Magdalene, they have two kids, they have a daughter named Sarah, and a son, a younger son, I forget what his name was. But what piqued my curiosity, Don, was that this gospel portrays Jesus as being highly political mm -hmm. and being involved in a nonviolent rebellion against Rome. It mentions taxes and that he was a, a tax revolutionary as well as being a spiritual leader. So it wasn't the fact that what interests everybody was it portrayed Jesus as married, but it also portrays him as being highly political and being involved in a number of nonviolent things uh, against the Roman Empire and everything. So it also, they kind of go down that it would have been highly unusual for the cult, the Jewish culture at the time, for Jesus to have been unmarried. Supposedly, at that time, women, if they weren't married before 15, someone was, something was wrong. They usually married between age 14 and 15. And a Jewish man had to be married by age 18, that it would have been highly unusual for someone not to be married after if they're 18. But what they also found out was that the Bible show or the gospel show Jesus teaching in the synagogue. He reads from the Torah and he teaches in the synagogue. If he would if he would not have been married, he would have been banned from doing anything in the synagogue because an unmarried man who's above the age of 18 couldn't even participate in the synagogue, let alone teach. That I did not know. I, I, had, I have not heard of such a regular. Is that is? It's that, from the culture. I mean, it's from the culture at the time. A, a, a generally accepted, according to this particular source that we're talking about. No, according to uh, several Jewish rabbis that have commented uh -huh. on this. Okay. That. To have not been married after 18 would have been a horrible violation of the Torah. There's, all, there's always been, to my mind, a strong suspicion that he may have been. I don't think we can go stronger than that, but I think that the, the idea that he may, that it's at least as good a bet that he was 
as that he wasn't. The silence of the Gospels themselves, because Christianity by that time was getting a little bit ascetic, prudish even. If he had been unmarried, it would have made it into a bragging point. Well, the, the Pharisees would have attacked him for it. And according to this one rabbi, the yeah. Pharisees wouldn't have even argued with him because he had no standing. Being unmarried puts him in a class that he would not even have the standing to argue with the Pharisees. So why did they ever include that into who Jesus was, that he wasn't married? Why does the church, I'm saying Catholicism, you know, Augustine and Constantine and that bunch, why did they stress that Jesus wasn't married? Why couldn't he have been a man? Well, it happened, supposedly, why priests aren't married is they're following Jesus, and he was unmarried. But they, they, there never has been. Well, it's a very good question why. What, what justification they thought they may have had, but there's never been any scriptural justification one way or the other. It's a transfer of property thing all over again. There's the church line on why priests are celibate, but the historical reason is because in medieval times, all the property went to the eldest son. This was during feudalism. That means if you had more than one son, you had a problem. Actually, one of the main reasons for the Crusades was to get all of the younger sons out of the household and away to reduce all the fighting that went on in a household. Because you have, if you had three or four sons, they were constantly at each other's throats because only one of them was going to inherit and all the rest were completely left out. But when the priesthood became part of the ruling class, because normally what a family would do is the youngest son always got donated to the church. In other words, whoever was the youngest son, you went into the church and went up through the church. And the church was a very powerful political institution. Being in the church Many of the bishops and everything during medieval times owned property, just like all the other uh, the all the other landed gentry did. The church owned a lot of property. The main problem was the church wanted to keep the money in the church. So if priests are celibate, they have no children to give their money to. Therefore, everything that they have goes to the church. And it was a mechanism designed to keep the wealth in the church because you kept them from marrying. But get back to the main trunk of, you, of, of, of that source that you were talking about. I mean, have, have you said all you wanted to say about it? it was just I, I haven't read the book. I just read the prologue last night while I was watching True Lies. Well, it's, so it, uh, but I thought you would be interested in it because... I want to have a discussion also of this... Uh, uh, of the methods that are used to determine what's good evidence from the New Testament. I was having this conversation with Jeff. Well, one of the things that we were reading, this author, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Catholic author, Croissant. Um, he, uh, he has a method, and his method involves the attempt to date sources, and try to get the ones that are close, closest to Jesus. And it seems to me very, very tenuous and I want to get I want to get back to this to this thing about indeed the tax rebellion was an important part of what he was doing. So the, the evidence for so many of these things is is not at all clear, and it never will be. Here's the I mean this there has been this idea since the 19th century, this quest for the historical Jesus. That one of these days we're going to do it. We're going to we're going to achieve it. I think we've come to the point of understanding that there's never going to be an uncontroversial solution to the problem. Well, no, if you look at, actually, it's not Croissant's method, it's the, actually the Jesus Seminar's method. He, That's right. He kind of, he, he was instrumental in formulating it, but his That's all index... I mean. That's all I meant from that particular book. Yes, the Jesus Seminar and that Logos uh, website that you were talking about is also involved in, in this in this methodology. Go ahead. But you were looking for references uh, for taxes or taxation in relation to Jesus, and 
I do have a database. The reason why I couldn't find it is I was searching the Thomas and the Q database, and there's zero mention of taxes or tax collectors in either Q or Thomas. They're not mentioned. They, the first time it appears is in Mark. Right. And that's, there's about, I think, 14 references in Mark to either taxes or tax collectors. Remember, however, that Mark is our only good source when it comes to the doings of Jesus. Those other texts that you mentioned, Q and Thomas, are both sayings collections. Sayings and parables. Right. And that's because that... There's actually an international Q symposium that's worldwide <coughs> that basically control, well, I don't say control, but they are, they put out most of the information on Q. There seems to be a modest amount of agreement, in, but, but since Q is a reconstructed gospel from within three others, you're never going to prove that it's correct because you don't have access to the actual document. Supposedly, Matthew and Luke had a copy of Q sitting in front of them that they incorporated into both Matthew and Luke. The definition of Q is its material that's in Luke and Matthew that's the same but does not appear in Mark. Even though the, the Luke and Matthew do different things with Q, inserting it in different places and modifying it in different ways. And there are modifications. And by the way, there's this hypothesis that's out there that Luke gets closer. I don't know why they, well, what enables them to think this way, but they believe that, and so conventionally when they cite where in Q, uh, uh, something from Q, they give the Luke connection to the Q document to go to as the closer to the Q they think than Matthew, even though Matthew supposedly comes five or ten years earlier than Luke in terms of when it was written. Well, the standard, when you look at Q, is they use the verse structure of Matthew because the material that's common to Matthew and Luke, there's more in Matthew than there is in Luke, so they use the Matthew chapter and verse not to pass it on to so Q. Not, so not just for person. review purposes... Uh, the first gospel that they said came out was Mark, Mark, correct? And then you had Matthew next, which had a copy of Mark, and then you also had Luke, which Re had a copy probably of Around the same time Matthew, as Matthew, or slightly really say, yeah, later, okay. that's right. I just wanted to make sure, you know, but at get, each one of them, in. <laughs> but there are two more sources. Yeah. Matthew, in addition to all of that, Matthew has some of his own stuff, and it's, it's, it's sizable. In the case of Luke, he has his own, and they call that M. Mm -hmm. that's, another, yeah. that's another hypothetical source. In other words, they have the M material. That means material peculiar to Matthew. Okay, then they have Luke, an L source, which is material peculiar to Luke. And so those, those so Matthew, so excuse me, so Mark and Q and M and L are the four okay. totals for the Synoptic Gospels. And John... You keep John completely to the side. The Gospel of John is all, is in a category all by itself. Very, very little connection. So is Q a combination of the three? Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No, no Mark. No Mark? As, just Matthew. By and, definition, Q is what's common to Matthew and Luke but outside of Mark. Which is okay. outside of Mark. Right. So, and it truly gets weird. I'm a member of academia.net, edu. It's a repository that's, that has all the academic articles. It's, it's like this giant place where many of the academic articles that they can get a hold of, you pay a subscription per year to right. it. It's good, good but it's, it's, it's legitimate stuff. It's yes. not like it, it's, it's real stuff. And real mostly, real journal articles. Yeah. And I ran across this Swedish guy who had a huge amount on Thomas. So I got some of his stuff down, started to read it, and it's like he claims to have solved the synoptic problem. He says, it's real simple. Matthew and Luke actually knew each other and sat side by side while they wrote their Gospels. <laughs> and that's why the material agrees so much. 
Jesus never, ever existed. He's totally fictitious. He was basically, the, the people that wrote the Gospels literally created him to serve a purpose. Mark was the first, then Matthew and Luke, and they were sitting side by side writing their Gospels together. This is why, and this totally solves the synoptic problem. But his claim is that, well, Jesus never existed. So he may have solved the problem, but he's totally ignored all the evidence that points to Jesus yeah. really existing. Wow. So there's a lot of you got there's a lot of strange people running around. There's also another guy who says that Matthew and Luke were Luke was written to counter Matthew. That Luke actually disagreed strongly with what was in Matthew because it was too Jewish and too legalistic. And basically, Luke softens all of these things to take the legalism out of it because either Luke was either a Hellenistic Jew or he was a Gentile. And he didn't really appreciate Matthew's legalism. So he wrote his gospel to be more of like a newspaper article or a true make it sound like a true biography, and he softened all the legalistic points. And there's always been a feeling that Luke was therefore a little bit later than Matthew. So you have some time between Mark and Matthew, and you have some more time to get to Luke. What's interesting also here, one more puzzle, and, I, and I've seen attempts to bury this puzzle and to make light of it, but to me it's a big puzzle. We make a mistake with Luke. We actually broke Luke up. Luke published one work in two big chunks. That was Luke, Luke Acts. 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 Okay. As one, he, but it's one thing to it. He and it takes the form of a letter to to a Theophilus. So we don't know who Theophilus is, but he's writing. It's apparent. It's a Gentile, suspiciously Gentile-sounding name. And Luke is reputed to have possibly been the only Gentile writer, and he's writing to the Gentiles. We know this. So if we date him accordingly, if we date him so after Matthew comes after Mark, we have to give him a date of something like 85 or 90 AD to Luke, okay? Question, why does Luke and Acts, which remember was published at the same time as the gospel that he wrote, why does he have the end of Acts? What's going on? Things are really going great. Yes, he's in, uh, Paul is, in uh, prison, he's in, under house arrest. He's living in a very nice house, by the way. He's able to have all of his guests, and he's preaching the word, the gospel, and it ends. Why is it that Luke contains no mention of what happens to Paul? Who do we have on, uh, on Zoom? Hello? Oh, sorry, it's Eileen. Good morning, Eileen. We just we kind of have a slim crowd today. It's like four people, so we're kind of we're kind of wambling around. So if uh, that's fine, that's fine. I'm just going to listen in. I'm dog watching, and I hadn't gotten back to my walk in time to start the same time you guys did. But um, yeah, I'm here just listening. Okay, okay. it's interesting. Hi. Keep going. <laughs> So, so if if Luke is writing in 60, 60, in, in eighty five or ninety, and we know that uh, uh, Paul probably died around sixty four, the years that he's writing about, he gets he gets to Rome around sixty two, and this is the period of time when he's sort of waiting to appear before the emperor. He is pleading his case to the emperor that he's been unjustly accused and so forth, and he's a citizen, he's allowed to do this, he's given a nice place to live under house arrest. And it ends with him preaching. No mention of his death. Why is it that Acts ends at that point if it was not written until 20 years later? Why are we given no closure on this story whatsoever? And it, to me, it's a, it, I've seen attempts to answer it, that, uh, but it, it, it seems to me a very striking question well the the general if you i think you have to go back to chapter 27 of acts it's not at the very end basically it when you if you look at this paul shows up and he's brought the money that he collected for the poor 
and he's expecting to be welcomed by the church in Jerusalem. He shows up, and there's immediately a crowd that wants to arrest him. And they force him to go into the temple. He's been accused of, I'm not sure what you'd call it, not adhering to the Torah, or basically he has... He was impure, and he had to go into the temple for, th I think it was three days, to purify himself because he was, I don't know, what it wasn't blasphemy, but there were, there were a group of leaders there, and it does indeed mention James is there and several other people, and James is strangely silent in all of this. They, they, these people accuse him, he goes to the temple, and when he comes out, he gets arrested because someone had gone to the Romans and basically complained about him to the Romans, and the Romans show up and they arrest him. And it's you have to look at what Luke leaves out that's conspicuous here because James is there. He never accepts the gift. He never embraces Paul, and he never stands up for Paul or anything. He's just kind of looking on. And at that point, Paul gets arrested, and at that point, he, being a Roman citizen, he has the right to appeal to the emperor. So he winds up going to Festus, who's the, the, he's the governor or whatever, but this is what sets him on his way back to Rome. He eventually winds up in Rome, where he supposedly dies around 63 or 64, when the Jewish rebellion really gets wound up and everything. And most of the scholars that look at Luke saying Luke soft pedals the disagreement between James and Paul. And it gets kind of minimized because you look at Paul's letters and they tend to not be quite the same about the Jerusalem council or council when Paul was given the right to go and preach to well, the you, Gentiles. You had, like I said all along, factions. You had people trying to uh, influence be the influencers at the time, uh, and then the whole story gets lost. Question, because everybody else is going to ask out there, why were these things written down as they occurred? Why did it always have to take 30, 40 years later? That, for that, to write that's an down? easy one to answer. You're looking at a culture where 98% of the people are illiterate. Also, writing is expensive. You have to, it's expensive and you have to have someone with the leisure time to learn how to read and write. And many people think Paul dictated his letters to a scribe, that Paul didn't write them himself, he dictated them to a scribe who wrote them down. But the system was such that only certain people could write and they were very few and it was very expensive. In order to write things down, you needed to have either a parchment, which is basically dry, uh, treated and dried animal skin, which was much more durable than papyrus. Papyrus was the other thing, which is kind of like paper. Parchment was much better because it was more durable. But people didn't write things down. They maintained an oral tradition, which is how people would have communicated the teachings of Jesus before the Gospels were written, they told their friends, they, they, they went to people that maybe had heard Jesus preach or something, but like the game Telephone, it had, you know, oral traditions tend to get modified over time. But that's why it took so long to write them down. They, they speculate that at some point they went, oh gosh, we're getting a ways away here. Someone better write this down so it'll be there at some point in time. Getting conflicting information, and it's like, that's not what he meant. James is probably saying, when Paul's preaching, that's not what Jesus meant. And then Paul's saying, well, Jesus came to me in the dream, and he told me, you know, I'm the modern-day prophet, and this is what uh, is supposed to go on from here on out for the church. And he had his own ideas. And then you had Peter standing in the middle saying, I'll take a little bit of uh, James, and I'll take a little bit of Paul, and we're good to go. <laughs> well, this is why the letters of Paul are so important, because yeah. from a historical point of view, any first-hand written knowledge is considered superior to anything else. We've got what we think are seven of Paul's original letters that Paul dictated or wrote. Paul is certainly familiar with who Jesus was as an historical person. 
More than that, he knows his family. He talks about his family. So that in and of itself would be considered the best historical information we have on Jesus. But Jesus is also mentioned by Josephus and a number of other people, although it's further down the road. But there's a further complicated problem. Yes, everything that Jeff has said is true, including the importance of the oral tradition. But it's not as if we know that there were no written documents before Mark. We just don't have them. If you raise the question that I asked, raised with you in, in brief correspondence this week, what were Mark's own sources? It's easy to say on the one hand that he had oral traditions, but a lot, but, but the possibility or even the probability that there was a, sometimes they call it proto-Mark, that there was an earlier version of Mark. There's some reason to believe that what Matthew and Luke had was an earlier version of Mark than the one that we have now. So the the we don't know is so strong here. We don't I, know. I have a I have a picture I'll send to you this week. It's from Burton Mac mm -hmm. is considered one of the leading Q scholars. He was he was one of the original people that started the ball rolling with what Q was and where it came from. And he's written two books for the general population. One of them is Who Wrote the New Testament? And the other one is The Gospel of Q. And uh, he's the one that kind of originally put together Q with the help of Kloppenberg and several other people. He has a diagram in, in his book on, on Q of basically Mark is sitting here in the center and all these other arrows are going into Mark. And part of it comes from Thomas, part of it comes from, from uh, one layer of Q, part of it comes from something called the miracles tradition. Supposedly there was an oral tradition of the miracles that Jesus did. So there are a number of arrows that are pointing into, into Mark. But Mark then wrote probably the best book on Mark. It's called A Myth of Innocence, and it's about the compilation of Mark. Regrettably, it doesn't exist in Kindle format. It's only in paper format. But I've got the book, and uh, I'll, I'll lend it to you. It's, I love that. It's, but it's, it's basically, it's one of the best scholars in this area looking at how Mark came together and why. But this is a scramble also. And I don't know what justifies it to put Q, for example, earlier than Mark. What justification do we have? We have justification for putting Q as as Mark, the same as Mark, well, at least a few years before Matthew, because we know that Matthew. But well, we date Matthew as late as seventy or seventy-five A.D. They want to go the other extreme. They want the, the, there's this desire to find an earlier source, and they, and they want to find, and here it goes with Thomas also, they want the, the arguments that are these beliefs, that these are texts that go back maybe to the 50s. Maybe they do, but the maybe is very, very strong here. I want to know what, what kind of weight this dating has. Well, if you look at the diagram I have, Q supposedly has three different layers to it, and the layers are justified by the material that's in them. The earliest layer is nothing but sayings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The second layer has parables of Jesus. The third layer actually has some stories about Jesus. So the rationale is the earliest of what we have would probably have been people writing down what Jesus said. And then later the stories developed about what he did. So Burton Mack actually has the third layer and the second layer of Q pointing into Mark as going into Mark, but there, there's no real way to date Q other than by the material it contains and whether you think what's the earliest of that material. Thomas is very different. Q, we don't have a copy of it. It's, it's a hypothetical gospel that has been archaeologically dug out of, 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 uh, of Matthew and Luke. Thomas 
we have an original copy of the whole document. We know that document goes back to an Aramaic core based on the linguistic studies. It's nothing but sayings. So the argument with Thomas is two things. Is it independent, which means it's independent of any of the other gospels, and it's early. And the consensus that they, now that they've done the linguistic studies and everything, the consensus is that Thomas was early and independent. And it's based on the fact that it was written in Aramaic and it's nothing but sayings. So you'll never prove the date for it. It's always going to be a consensus. I, I would be, be receptive, therefore, from, from, from everything that you've said to the idea that Q may be as early as Mark. But, place, but there's a desire to place it earlier, to, 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 to say we can do better than Mark. We're getting closer with this hypothetical Q document than Mark itself. That I don't see strong reason for. Dating Mark 66 to 70, there's di dispute on whether it's as late as 70. It could be as early as 66, they say. Dating Mark 66 to 70, okay. How do you get Q 10, they want to put him 10 years earlier, put it 10 years earlier, or the like. Same with the early stratum of Thomas. There are, actually have, this is what I was going to talk about today, but the, you can see a progression from Thomas into Mark, into Matthew, into Luke, and then eventually into John. Say more about how do you see this progression? I'm about to, I'm about to read it to you. Good. The, in general, the sayings in Q tend to be more archaic and simplistic, okay. and they seem to be glossed with more information as they move forward. So note, note the seem to be. So it's always going to be seem to be. Yeah. Now, and uh, this is a, a sequence that's called ask, see, and knock. The, the other thing is that the Gospel of Thomas appears to carry a totally different message when you look at it as a whole than Mark does, the, based on how the sayings are phrased. So this is an important one because it goes to the core of what is in Thomas in terms of we go back to this, the Jesus in Thomas is concerned about the kingdom of God and how to bring it about. And it's a different idea than what is eventually evolves into the synoptic gospels and into John. It's about a personal struggle within you. In other words, the kingdom of God is to be realized now, and you have to do a certain number of things to realize the kingdom of God but it's within the individual to have that happen. We don't need a savior. Jesus is not portrayed as a savior or have any redemptive ability to him. He's, He's a teacher a of wisdom. Teacher. That's right. So it starts out, the very first one is Jesus says, the one who searches will find, to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Pretty simple statement. He then has another statement in Thomas that expands on it. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over all. So this is describing a process, a hard process. It, it, the first statement is, continue seeking until you find. There's an implication there that don't give up. It's going to be difficult. You need to keep doing this until you actually find. And then it says when you find, you're going to be disturbed. And after you're disturbed, you'll start to understand, and then you'll finally realize it. So it's, it's a path of individual attainment, basically, of spiritual attainment. We then go to Mark. All These statements are in all four Gospels, and that's how we can see it change. In Mark, it's... So I tell you, whoever, whoever, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. It now goes from an, this individual describer. Mark has, you pray about it. He's kind of simplified it. 
but he does have that you have to do some prayers involved in this process of seeking and knowing. And then Matthew changes this to whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Again, Matthew retains the part about prayer. Matthew also has another statement that ask and it will be given to you, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. So he simply kind of rephrases it. So when we get to Luke, so I say to you, ask and it will be given you, search and you will find, knock and the door will be open for you. No mention of prayer. Mm -hmm. We don't need prayer anymore. We just need to ask. John now really gets kind of freelance with this. John says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Now Jesus becomes the genie in the bottle. All you got to do is rub the lamp, and he will grant what you want. Yes, but you must rub this particular lamp. Well, it, only, you, only through Jesus. Only, you can come yeah. only through me. Otherwise, the Maserati won't be in the driveway. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Here, and it, it, he has several more that are interesting. Uh, On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so your joy may be complete. Now you have to have to ask God in Jesus' name. So it now is depending on your belief in Jesus as to whether or not what you ask for will be granted. It's evolved from a process of individual spiritual quest into if you believe the right thing and ask for it properly, you're going to get it, whatever it is. And he finishes up with this is, this is in John 16 with the title, Jesus' Victory Over the World. I have said these things to you in figurative ways. An hour is coming when I will speak to you in figurative sayings no longer, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God, it will be granted to you. So, at, by the end of the gospel, this is complete now. We've taken this from a clearly defined spiritual quest that is the responsibility of the person to, to start and to follow through and is difficult to where if you believe the right thing and ask the right person, you got to get what you want. And from here, it's just one more step to Reverend Ike saying, believe and send me money, and you'll have that Maserati in your driveway. <laughs> this is one of the few instances that you can follow the sayings all the way from Q to where they finally wind up in John as being literally the original message of Jesus got buried. It got superseded by the belief in Jesus being what's important rather than the teachings of Jesus being important. And, and with him being the mediator of the whole thing, only through him can, can salvation be found. All you have to do, what? Is go through him, believe in him, whatever that means. That's one of the reasons why they think whenever you're looking at something and you have it from a historic, from a historic point of view, if you find information that doesn't agree with the general consensus, or is embarrassing, that tends to lend it more weight. An example of that is Jesus is baptized by John. It's in all four Gospels. You can't ignore it. But it's embarrassing. It doesn't kind of fit with the rest of what's in the Gospel because it has Jesus being subservient to John. Therefore, historians think it probably happened. It wouldn't have gotten included in all four Gospels unless it had a high probability of being true, but the fact that it's also kind of embarrassing lends it even more credence. 
So you look for things, if you're looking at something that's independent and early, it may not agree or be in a more primitive form. So you take the fact that they know that at least half of Thomas was written in Aramaic, or they think it was, and the fact that the message in Thomas is very, very different than the message in Mark. It gets mutated by the time it gets to Mark to Jesus being more central in belief than the actual spiritual quest being central for the kingdom of God. Therefore, this is why they think Thomas is independent and early. And again, there are people that will disagree with that. So you're never going to have definitive proof of this, but it's like everything even in science. It's a preponderance of the evidence, what makes sense and what makes things fit. As we'll see next week, I, 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 the lesson for today was to look at what Jesus defines as the spiritual quest. What was his message in Thomas? That's also, everything that's in Thomas is just about, at least in Mark, Matthew, or Luke in some degree, but it's been changed. It's been kind of reworded and smoothed out to make Jesus more central. And the fact that it's a teaching that you need to actually do becomes less and less significant as Christianity progresses. And mainly as Paul has a greater influence in, Paul was not interested in Jesus's teaching. He was interested in who Jesus was and what that meant. Many people say if you want to go back and find out what Jesus actually taught and what Jesus expected of his followers to do, you're going to find the best evidence for it in, in Thomas in its original form, possibly, or in a simpler form that gets modified in the other gospel. And yet, it remains a non-canonical text that will be rejected by all forms of orthodoxy, and the idea of treating it as perhaps even more important than the four Gospels that we have. We, we do have to recognize that this is a somewhat scandalous proposition to Orthodox Christianity, that the four Gospels that we have are not as good a source on Jesus as a source that has been rejected or not accepted. And that's the problem with Thomas ever being accepted by the more conservative scholars. It is the, the history of Thomas, they think. We have references to Thomas by a number of early church fathers. Uh, they actually quote it, and the quotes are actually in Greek and very close to what's almost identical to what's in the actual verse in Thomas. Do you feel that they had access to it when they came up with the Bible? Uh, August they were reading came. from it, they yes. They were going to say, hey, this is one of the books we might include. You see, yes, at Oregon. Ah, had, at least throw that Thomas yeah. book out. Well, no, they, they had a copy of it in front of them. And they found Greek versions of Thomas in the mm -hmm. Oxyrhynchus papyri that probably date back to 130, 140. But all of a sudden, at about 250 AD, it disappears. No one quotes it anymore, and it certainly wasn't even considered when you look at the discussions at Nicaea for what, what are the lists of, the, there's only one person that has the Gospel of Thomas on his list of the books that should be in the Bible, and he's a Gnostic. The only version of Thomas that we have was found in a jar from an Egyptian monastery with a bunch of other Gnostic Gospels, Basically, the people who saved it were the heretics. They were the Gnostics who disagreed, and they preserved this gospel where the, the church literally tossed it out, forgot about it, and it was deemed heretical, and no one saved it. The only way we even know about it is a group of, of heretic monks who were Gnostics managed to preserve it and stick it in a jar. You know, it's interesting, though, in Thomas, the parables and in the, and all the quotes, you're just like, how could they... The Bible back then wasn't seen as entertainment reading or that the learn, the common man was going to learn from this. It was going to be elders and scribes were going to teach or rabbis and uh, priests would eventually teach these things to people. And it was what they wanted to teach, what their end goal was their end game was. They never thought, I guess, the average man was going to be able to read this and say, wow, 
that's something, the, the quotes that, that I get out of this. You get a whole lot more out of a single quote than you do mm-hmm. reading, you know, chapter after chapter of something. You're like, what, what, what did they do? What? Well, I have a whole series of here that's in the material I sent out in my email that yeah. we'll talk about next yeah. week that elaborate on this. But I want to just finish up here with one parable that's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's only in Thomas. Good. Awesome. And it's the, the parable of the empty jar. And it's kind of, when you read this, it's kind of a sad thing, and you'll see why. Jesus said, The kingdom of the Father is like a certain woman who was carrying a jar full of meal. When she was walking on the road, still some distance from home, the handle of the jar broke, and the meal emptied out behind her on the road. She did not realize it. She had noticed no accident. When she reached her house, she set the jar down and found it empty. The end. (laughs) Several things about, it's a long road, and she didn't realize that anything was wrong. Now, you would think if the jar was emptying out, she noticed that it was getting lighter. What was in the jar in the first place? Grain. 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 Grain's in the jar. It's a parable of spirituality. You start out with a full jar, and eventually the world works on you, and it slowly drains away, and you don't notice it. It's about the fact that it's about spiritual ignorance and how it can disappear slowly. And it ends just like, and she found it empty, and end of story. You can relate it to the time you have in your life all the good deeds and the righteousness things that you could do, or spend time with family and friends and helping others. And as you start on that journey, you've got all this potential as it gets later and later in time and years, and you've done none of it. That meal or that grain never went to be planted for future generations, and it never was eaten to sustain the people of today. Hey, I can, I can, offer, you missed out. I can mm-hmm. offer an alternative interpretation. Jesus was a, was obsessed with the seed metaphor. Grain is seeds. What she was doing could be given, a, given an entirely alternative interpretation. Without knowing it, all the way home she was spreading the seed. All the way home, while she was walking, she was disseminating without even knowing it. Now, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying it's not a bad interpretation, it's a possible interpretation. And I wanted to get it on here before <laughs> <laughs> That's not weird.